You understand? We need to, I know. I mean, do you say?
everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And I'd like to welcome you. My name is Dr. Shkobi Wilson. I'd like to welcome you to the seventh annual Community Engagement Environmental Justice and Health Lecture. Uh, the lecture was started to give us the opportunity to hear from speakers working on environmental justice and health issues um, in the region and across the country. Previously, uh, some of our uh, special um, speakers have included Lois Gibbs, Dr. Ball, some of our work uh, with Love Canal. We also had Omega Wilson, some of the work down in North Carolina, our own former mayor uh, of College Park, Andy Fellows, uh, was a speaker. And additionally, we had uh, Fred Tuckman, uh, the Productive Riverkeeper, speak. Um, and, and this event, I think it's really important that it provides an opportunity for us to come together and really get grounded in environmental justice, what it is, uh, communities impacted by environmental justice, why do we have environmental injustice, and also talk about solutions, um, interventions, things that we need to do to address environmental justice, things that we need to do to advance an environmental justice agenda. This lecture is part of a a larger event that we're having this year. Uh, next Saturday, we'll be having the fourth UMD Environmental Justice and Health Symposium. Uh, this was supposed to be the opening keynote for the symposium, but due to space issues, we had to do some arrangements, some rearrangements. So, Dr. Buller is basically the opening uh, speaker for our nine days of environmental justice. <laughs> <laughs> so nine days of environmental justice. And then next, um, next Saturday, uh, the morning keynote speaker is going to be Destiny Watford from Free Your Voice. Okay. So I would like to thank some of our, we had a lot of sponsors who are supporting both uh, this event and, of course, also the symposium. And those sponsors include, include SRAP, Center for Equity, Center for Literacy, National Center for Smart Growth, Choose Clean Water Coalition, Audubon National Society, the Lily League Solutions, Sarah. Earth Justice, the School of Public Health, Sierra Club, Chesapeake Bay Trust, Chesapeake Bay Program, Town Creek Foundation, Bridgewater County Parks and Recreation, Succinct, Chispa, League of Conservation Voters, Moms Clean Air Force, We Act for Environmental Justice, Namati, Food and Water Watch, uh, Rachel Carson Council, the UMD Sustainability Fund, and also the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. Hopefully that covered all our sponsors, so thank you. Um, we appreciate your support. And so I would like to now introduce Dr. Robert Bullock, our seventh uh, annual Siege uh, keynote speaker, lecturer. Uh, before I get into this official intro, as I mentioned briefly when the students came up and, and took a picture, I told y'all in class, and somebody told you the interns, in, I forget what month, but in 1995, I met Dr. Bullock at a conference at the Elizabeth City State University. Um, I took a picture when I still was able to grow my goatee. That's one of the jokes. I can't grow anymore. Um, I had a three-inch long goatee. I was in the middle of the picture with Dr. Bullard on one side and Dr. Chavis on the other side. Sophomore year in college. So meeting Dr. Bullard and Dr. Chavis at that uh, conference really cemented for me my, my interest and drive to be a scientist who worked on environmental justice issues. That's sort of a personal story. Another personal story, Dr. Bullard also is a graduate of my um, um, undergraduate alma mater, uh, Alabama Agricultural Mechanical University. So it's another parallel. So it's great to have Dr. Bullard here. But getting back to this official uh, bio, Dr. Robert D. Bullard is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy in the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs yeah. at Texas Southern University in Houston, <laughs> HB. 
HBCU. <laughs> Professor Bullard received his degree from PhD degree from Iowa State University. He is often described as the father of environmental justice. He is the author of 18 books that address sustainable development, environmental racism, urban land use, industrial facility siting, community reinvestment, housing, transportation, climate justice, emergency response, smart growth, and regional equity. Dr. Bull has testified as an expert witness and served as a technical advisor on hundreds of civil rights lawsuits and public hearings over the past three decades. In 1990, he was the first environmental justice scholar to receive the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Achievement Award in science for dumping in Dixie, race, class, and environmental quality. That photo that you see is from Dr. Dixon. Professor Bullock was featured in July 2007, CNN People You Should Know. Uh, green issue is black and white. In 2008, he was named by Newsweek as one of the 13 environmental leaders of the, of the century. In 2013, he was honored with the Sierra Club John Mayer Award, the first African American to win the award. In 2014, the Sierra Club named his new environmental justice award after Dr. Bullock. I believe the uh, nomination date is. June 1st? Yes, it's on my agenda. In June 2015, Iowa State University presented him his, uh, its National Alumni Merit Award. In the same year, the American Bar Association presented him with the Excellence in Environmental Energy and Resources Stewardship Award. And in 2017, the Children's Environmental Health Network presented him with the Child Health Advocate Award. His latest books include Race, Place, and Environmental Justice After Hurricane Katrina, Struggles to Reclaim, Rebuild, and Revitalize New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, Environmental Health and Racial Equality in the United States, Strategies for Building Just, Sustainable, and Livable Communities, and The Wrong Complexion for Protection, How the Government Response to Disasters Endangers African American Communities. Please give a big, robust Round of applause for our seventh annual Siege keynote speaker, Dr. Robert D. Bullard. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, that's a Kobe. Uh, the the antidote that he was uh, was really um, inspiring because, you know, as a teacher, you never know who is listening. And, and it, it's really um, rewarding to see a young person that you met years ago really uh, take charge and stay on the path that that he or she decided to take. And we had a long conversation uh, at that conference, I don't know how many years ago, but 95 is a long time ago. And uh, the, the idea of, of working on issues around justice and health and justice and environment and justice in any of the areas where there, there's so much inequality, you know, as an old, School teacher, you know, I'm always pushing and trying to say, yeah, go and do it. Just do it. So I'm really um, glad to be here at the University of Maryland and at this conference and to uh, share with you some of the work that I've been doing for, for at least four decades. And um, many of the issues that we started on years and years ago, uh, we've made a lot of progress, but there's so much uh, that is uh, that needs to uh, that needs to change, and the only way that change is made is when we all decide that uh, we can no longer tolerate the injustice and the inequality. And I think it's important for young people out there to understand and know what your role is. Every social movement that has been successful in this country has always had a strong student and youth component. Young people drive change. College students are very, um, have an integral part of 
making that change in I don't have to tell you that. You know what's and you know what's going on all across this country, and you see what's happening. And I'm sure uh, many of you are part of that, uh, a part of that movement of young people making change, pushing, uh, and and demanding that we uh, do better as a country. Okay, so so my talk is strong complexion for protection, race, place, and the politics of pollution. I'm a sociologist by training, and I'm an environmental sociologist. And I'm proud to say that I am an environmentalist. And I have been black most of my life. <laughs> uh, so my job is as a sociologist and as an environmental sociologist and as an environmentalist uh, is to connect the dots. And you know, I've been told that I'm very good at connecting dots. I was good as a kid. You know the game you play and you connect the dots? Connecting dots, that's what we do, sociologists. I tell um, people who may not know me. I am a sociologist by training, but I do not do dead white man sociology. I do what's called scientifically kick-ass sociology. So, so the work that I do, hopefully somebody will take it, whether it's the research or the policy work or the civic engagement work, will take it and say, ha, huh, I see something that I can use and apply. And so that's how I define kick-ass sociology. So let's, let's get on with it. Uh, I like to write, and I like to see my name in print. For some reason, I, I like to write. And I received my undergraduate degree from Alabama A&M University in Huntsville. That's the COVID. And my master's degree in sociology from the Department of, Department of Sociology that was at Atlanta University that was founded by W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, my, uh, Atlanta University was founded by the Freedmen's Bureau to educate former slaves. And I received my PhD from Iowa State University. So, you know, the, the idea of using your education for liberation ideas, education is a form of liberation. And so when you take your your education, you take the, the experiences that you have, and I, 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 am a, I am from Alabama. I grew up in South Alabama during a period of time when everything was segregated. Uh, but my parents instilled in me the importance of education. Uh, my mother and father, my grandmother would tell, would tell all of us in my family, that education is important. It's something that if you get it, nobody can take it away from you. Uh, and if you get an education, you can share. You can, you, can, you can give back. So for some reason, I have tried to give back in the way of doing work that can be applied. So. Some of the books I've written, you see them up on, this, on, this, on the screen. Invisible Houston, that was my first book. And I'll give you a little story behind how that occurred. Uh, Dumping in Dixie, In Search of the New South. In Search of the New South was a book written, published by the University of Alabama. When I was going uh, to college, I graduated from, uh, from high school in 1964, so long ago, ancient. Uh, black people couldn't go to the University of Alabama. Auburn, none of the white schools. I was, I, I was born in the bottom of the state in a little town called Elba, which is close to Florida line. And my university was at the top of the state, 300 miles away. And there was a, a university that was 29 miles away, Troy State University, we couldn't go there. Auburn University, we couldn't go there, closer. <laughs> university of Alabama, we went, so, so University of Alabama published uh, In Search of the New South. Ironic. I wrote that book, it's like 300 pages. I was searching for the New South. That, well, and the answer was in search of the New South. Did I find a New South? I found that there is no New South. It's only uh, repackaged. Invisible Houston, you know, Houston has the largest black population of any city in the South, over half a million black people, but they were invisible in 1978. Uh, 
Okay, so it's, it's 18 books, but it's just one book. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> books deal with housing, transportation, uh, environment, uh, dealing with disaster, dealing with climate, dealing with food security, dealing with health. You can put justice uh, after any of the titles of those books, and it's just one book. The, the quest for justice, fairness, and equity. So that's what that, those, uh, those books are about. And almost all of them involve some type of policy or some type of application of or research to action uh, to, to, to try to stimulate ideas and stimulate people uh, to be motivated to make change. I'm not talking rabble rousing. I've done my share. I came out of the 60s. And we were fearless. We were fearless. We didn't mind uh, coming up against, whether it was on a campus administration or out in the community, against uh, people who were trying to keep us from going to uh, parks and, 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 and schools and all the you know, public accommodation stuff. Some communities still have the wrong complexion for protection. You don't like catchy titles. And that, that title of that book uh, really asks the question, will the government respond, will the government response to disasters be fair? It doesn't matter if it's a health or if it's an environmental, if it's a natural disaster or, or a, um, uh, human-made disaster, human-induced. And when we ask that question, uh, most people know the answer. But in this case, this was, this was after Katrina. And, and a colleague and I wrote a book uh, on Katrina, looking at race, place, and environmental quality after Katrina. And we, all of you, I think, were alive in 2005, right? And you saw television, you saw the pictures, horrific images coming across the screen. And the government was very slow responding to what happened in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. And after we did uh, the book on Katrina, uh, Dr. Beverly Wright, who who's a native of, of New Orleans and uh, who's worked you know, at Xavier and worked at Dillard University and she's worked at Wake Forest University. Uh, we wanted to know was, what happened in Katrina? Was this the response, just a typical response or was it a fluke? And so we decided to look at this whole idea of government response to uh, catastrophes, disasters, um, and other kinds of, 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 of events. Uh, and we went all the way back to uh, the great Mississippi flood of 1927, and we brought it all the way up to the BP spill in 2010. And we explored, you know, government response to toxic contamination, uh, government response to um, hurricanes and floods, and, and government response to discrimination when, in terms of fa farmers, black farmers versus white farmers, when floods happen or when when droughts happen, how does the government respond to the different farmers? And we know, or how does the government respond to uh, a bioterrorist attack in terms of of um, of of when when people are threatened and and how does the government respond when it comes when you interject issues of race and class? Uh, long before Hurricane Katrina devastated U.S. Gulf Coast, people of color learned the hard way that waiting for the government can be hazardous to your health and the health of the community. Government response to natural and human-made disasters over the past eight, eight decades has not treated all communities equally and fairly. So, so this whole idea of the environment and the extent to which the environment um, actually is supposed to be nurturing. The environment is supposed to be a place or a space that, that that should not do you harm. If we are in 
in harmony with nature. And if we somehow, on the other extreme, create problems uh, in terms of how we uh, build things and how we dispose of things and how we extract, et cetera, uh, and if, in fact, th those, quote, benefits that, that's derived from those kinds of, of operations, uh, to what extent those benefits accrue to certain populations and, and to what extent do the externalities uh, somehow get shifted to other populations? The heart of the environmental justice movement uh, basically was to see how um, human-induced environmental problems, uh, environmental challenges get distributed and how public policies and regulations get enforced or not or don't get enforced. And so the environmental justice movement uh, challenged the dominant paradigm of, of, of that environment was something out there. Environment was something to be dominated. Right? Environment was something to be exploited. And this whole idea of the, to what extent uh, can we somehow change policy and regulations and, and practices that will minimize or eliminate uh, the disparities that, cre that are created by decision making? And so the environmental justice movement redefined what environmentalism is. For a long time, environmentalism was, was, was considered something uh, uh, akin to the sole domain of leisure class, white middle class, um, uh, something that, that was uh, the environment is out there. Uh, and, and the environment is, is uh, neutral. Uh, and that the environment uh, is is something that that uh, does not uh, does not discriminate. And what we were saying, as we start to challenge this whole idea of of what uh, governmental involvement meant, and the extent to which government uh, reflect the the dominant paradigm of the time instead of protecting uh, all communities, uh, to a large extent, the environmental regulations um, oftentimes were not uh, uh, neutral in their application and in their enforcement. And as you start to uh, figure out how things get so unequal, and if a community or a population uh, lives on, quote, the wrong side of the track, it, it, that community by design will receive less protection, will receive less of those amenities, of those conditions that make those communities whole, healthy, sustainable, livable, uh, resilient, et cetera. Now, what I'm talking about now is how good stuff get distributed and how bad stuff get distributed. And and it's not accidental, it's not coincidental, it's not something that drops out of the sky and gets distributed in a way that, uh, as if you throw it up and they fall down wherever it falls, falls down on the map. Redefine an environment. The environment, this is environmental justice, had redef redefinition. The environment is where we live, work, play, learn, worship, as well as the physical and natural world. The environment is everything. It, so, it's inclusive, it's connected. It's not just looking at one piece of it. And if we are to basically address many of the issues that face our communities, you know, whether it's in our cities, metropolitan areas, in our regions, states, nation, globally, we have to see how these various pieces connect. And, and so what this definition or redefinition uh, emerge out of grassroots communities and their struggles. For a long time, communities did not see 
housing separate from health, separate from transportation, or separate from whether or not grocery stores in the neighborhood are separate, separate from where they had a park, or et cetera. They saw it as community, and their environment was all those things. But as environmentalism got compartmentalized, some groups worked on birds, some groups worked on wetlands, some groups worked on, on, uh, on, on transportation, some groups worked on houses. Some, and to a large extent, many of those groups left out a major ingredient in terms of, of justice. And justice cuts across all of those areas. Justice is what, and equity, what, what brings all the pieces together. So environmental justice uh, embraces the principle that all people and communities are entitled to equal protection of environmental, energy, health, employment, education, housing, transportation, and civil rights laws. 1978, long time ago. I was two years out of graduate school. I graduated from Iowa State University with a PhD in sociology. And my, my area was demography, and I worked on housing segregation and, and, and housing discrimination. I worked with census data. I worked with, with data. Just say it like that. Now, this is ancient. Uh, and one day, uh, my wife came home and said, Bob, um, she, she graduated from Drake uh, Law School in, in Des Moines, Iowa. And we moved uh, to, to um, Texas. And, and one day she came home and she said, Bob, I've just sued um, the state of Texas. Now, I work for a state university, Texas Southern University. I said, you did what? She said, yeah, I sued the state of Texas. This, this company is trying to put this sanitary landfill in the middle of this black community in Northeast Houston. I, I said, hold up, hold up. Uh, you sued my employer. Now, I graduated from 1976, we moved to Texas in 1978. I was two years as a junior professor of sociology, no junior. And I said, um, OK, uh, let's, let's talk about this. She said, no, I need somebody. I just sued this, uh, this company. And I sued the state and the city and the, and the county to try to stop this landfill from going in this, this community. And, and uh, we, we got uh, three weeks before we going, uh, going to court and, and try, try to get this restraining order. And, and I, need, uh, I, I need, in a hurry, somebody to can figure out where these landfills and garbage dumps and solid waste sites are located and put it on a map and figure out who lives where. And, and I said, you need a sociologist. She said, that's what you are, right? <laughs> that's, how, that's a true story. That's how I got involved in doing this work accidentally. So I'm an accidental um, environmentalist. This is not something I planned. This is something that I got my arms twisted, my knuckles cracked. I said, that's a lot of work. She said, yeah, but we have to do this, because this is not fair. This company is trying to put this dump in the middle of this black community. There's nothing out there but black people in housing and trees. I said, well, I had, I had 10 students in my research methods class at Texas Southern University, Department of Sociology. And I said, students, we have a project. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I said, students, you have a project. And I said, we are going to do a study and find out the history of landfill siting in Houston, Texas from way back to when to 19, up until 1968, I mean, 1970, I'm sorry. And they looked at me uh, all, you know, they just stared at me. Now, they didn't know what we were embarking on, nor, neither did I, because there was no research protocol. There was nothing, no research on this stuff. And so we just got together and said, this is what we're going to do. And I went back home. I told them, I said, OK, we're going to do it. We're going to do it as a project. And I designed the research project. I figured out how we we're going to get the data. I figured out how we we're going to make sure that the data was accurate and that we we're going to be as comprehensive as we could, as possible, as humanly possible, since none of this stuff was computerized. 1978, there were no laptops, iPads, cell phones, 
GIS, none of that. I ran, we did all the research, ran it on punch cards. Hey, <laughs> flat maps, base maps, color coded. We had to piece together the block groups. You know, the sensor track was in books this big and, you, and it had pages. Ancient. <laughs> it's so easy now. Hey, that was back then. A hammer and a chisel. <laughs> pow, pow. We had magic marking pins. I'm not lying. Yellow, less than 10% minority. Green, 10% to 30%. And then orange, and we went all the way up. Red was 50% plus minority population. That was, that was the magic marker, and we had map, map pins. We went to the archives, the Houston archives, to find old records, the solid waste department, and I gave them a script. I wrote it up, and I typed it up on a select, IBM select typewriter. <laughs> you ever seen a typewriter? Yeah. Yeah. In, they're in museums now. You steal that one? They work. But don't let them break. <laughs> I typed up the, uh, up the script, and I gave it to everybody, all 10 students. And now this is what you say. Memorize it when you go into the city solid waste department. I'm a student at Texas Southern University in a, in a research methods class, Dr. Bowler. We're doing a study, and we want, we're trying to find out the history of landfill siting, solid waste siting in Houston, Texas as part of our research class. There was nothing in the script talking about anything legal, lawsuit, company, none of that. We were doing a research project. I was training my students not just talking research, we were going to do research. We tra I trained them in doing windshield surveys. I trained them in triangulation in terms of, of verifying the materials that we put together, these master lists of addresses that we were able to find where the facilities were, landfills, incinerators, and uncontrolled landfills. These are these were dumps, illegal dumps. We were able to find, put together our lists, and we, in some cases, we had to go and use microfiche, old newspapers. You ever, this is a library had, during a time when you had uh, catalog, card catalogs, and you had microfiche, and you want to look in, and then you have to go to the newspaper. We're trying to figure out, going all the way back to the 30s, to find out where landfills are located. You ever use microfiche? God, you go, all that stuff is mostly digitized now. But you go to the library, you open the box, you put it on the little machine, crank it up, crank it up, and then you look at the screen, go to the next page, shoot, it'll shoot by, shoot by. Boy, research is so easy now. I trained them in interviewing, interviewing techniques, face-to-face -face interviewing, and how to document. This is, this is the ethnographic part of the study. We were doing multi-methods multi research. Now, these are my sociologists that I was training, and it's real. You get the book stuff, and then you get the real stuff. This is real, this is uh, what they call ground truthing. Getting the real. Once you get these, these lists, I said, you go out and test. If this list, we had key maps, crisscross maps. One street and another street. This is how they locate the, the facility. I said, I told my students, I said, you know Houston is flat. I said, anytime you see a mountain, be suspicious. Landfill. <laughs> we found we found the oldest landfill, it wasn't a landfill, it was a dump. In Houston was the Fourth Ward dump, Fourth Ward, Freedmanstown. The community, this was founded by former slaves in the 1860s. That was the oldest dump we found was in the 30s. I found it through micro, my microfiche search, the old newspaper articles. Final said, um, it said, okay, no, let me back up. We interviewed a lady in Fourth Ward. These old people, they know where stuff used to be. 
They are just as reliable as Google. <laughs> so I was, we were Googling the community old people. <laughs> so what's, what's in this neighborhood? Was it, do you remember there was a landfill, a garbage dump, or burn up? And then we, went, we met one lady. She said, yes. She said, yes, boy, we had, I didn't say anything. She called me boy. Yeah, boy. We, fi- you, we found, she said, no, there was a landfill over there on, on, on West Dallas and I forget the cross street. She said, she said that, that landfill was over there. No, that dump was over there. Uh, and they closed it and they built a hospital on top of it. I said, no, I, I thought she was just pulling my leg. And she said, as a matter of fact, that was 1937. I was like, how can she remember? This lady was like 70-something years old back then in 79. She said, yeah. I said, how do how, how you know? She said, that's the year that my daughter had a gallbladder removal or operation or something. I said, okay. Now, she had mental memory on that. And I said, I'm going to check this. So I went back to the library, uh, the Houston Historical Archives Library. And I was looking at Houston Post 1937. I was looking for an article. I discovered that. This woman knew exactly what she was talking about. The ho- Jeff Davis Hospital, a newspaper article, new hospital built to be built on old Fourth War dump. I, when I knew that we were actually our data analysis and how we were able to get, retrieve the information, I knew it was accurate when we were able to find that kind of thing. We sent students out on the windshield surveys to find out if there were any artifacts left from these old facilities. In many cases, the, the artifacts were the city, the f- facility was not there anymore, but the city still owned the property as part of the city's solid waste department. Aha! Uh-huh. City still owned it, and it's still in the solid waste department. Uh, so uh, the, the Bean versus Southwestern Waste study, uh, that's what came about in 1979. Did the study. And I got an article published in 1983 on it. The, we were in federal court, and Bean versus Southwestern Waste Management Corporation, the first lawsuit challenging environmental discrimination using civil rights law. This was the first case. And the research for Bean case was conducted at Texas Southern, as I said before. I did the study in 79. All five of cities' landfills were in black neighborhoods. How do we know? These are all black neighborhoods. That's like me saying, well, I won't say predominantly black. That's like me saying my family is predominantly black. <laughs> Six out of the eight uh, city-owned incinerators were in black neighborhoods. And three out of four of the privately owned landfills were in black, black neighborhoods. Blacks only made up 25% of the population, but 82% of all the waste dumped in the city during the 30s up to 1978 was dumped on black people. Now, that's Significant. That's significant. Uh, and so the name of the landfill, get this, Whispering Pines. I, the name of the landfill sounds like a subdivision. I would love to live in Whispering Pines. Where do you live? I live in Whispering Pines. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman with his back turned was a justice of the peace. He, he had joined uh, the protest, and he was leading the, leading the charge with a bullhorn. Justice of the Peace. He's a congressman representing Houston right now, Congressman Al Green. You ever heard that name? No. Congressman Al Green is out there leading the charge. And people are protesting. There's nothing out there but trees and black people and houses. 85% of the people own their homes. This is not a ghetto. This is not a poverty pocket. This is an unlikely place for a landfill. Discovering that, for me, it was real. Decisions made by individuals. Houston is the only major city that doesn't have zoning, so it meant that some individual decided that the best place to put a landfill, incinerator, and garbage dump was where black people live. It was not until 1972 that the first African American was elected to the Houston City Council. So these were decisions made by white men. Put it somewhere else, put it over there. So, so, so when you talk about the foundation of, of my research and a lot of the, the methods that we developed early on, even though they were very crude, as years passed by with computers and GIS and mapping and even refining the way you uh, do your GIS mapping and using you know, the concentric, drawing the circle, I mean, placing the dot and then putting the circle and going out. 
I mean, it's like magic now. Place matters. And so inequality in the environment, we said, and discrimination in the environment, we say we should be attacking this as if we, as we have attacked housing discrimination, employment discrimination, you know, discrimination in voting, in education. But for some reason, there was pushback when we talk about let's dismantle environmental discrimination. There are so many people who didn't believe that the environment was not neutral, that the environment somehow, that environmental policies were not, were not carried out equally across the board, regardless of whether or not you lived in the city or the suburbs or whether you lived on the reservation or in the barrio. I mean, so, so we had to convince people that environmental discrimination or environmental injustice was real. In the United States, all communities are not created equal. If a community happens to be poor, a community of color, working class communities, or, or the community is physically located on the other side of the tracks, it gets less protection. Now, all kinds of studies document this now, but we, it took us a long time for, you know, to get enough research and a body of, of um, findings to convince people that this was real. And we know there's a direct correlation between exploitation of land and exploitation of people. The places that are most exploited also are the most befouled, the most polluted. The communities that are most politically unempowered, neglected, thank you, you find the most threat and the worst health. There's a link between zip code and health. Zip code is still the most powerful and potent predictor of health and well-being. Tell me your zip code, we can compute and tell you how healthy you are. So when we talk about this whole question of place matters and race matters and the fact that who gets what matters and how things get distributed, all that stuff matters. The poorest people in, within the U.S. have the worst health and the worst and the most degraded environment. This is not rocket science. A lot of it is political science. A lot of it is political science. So when we talk about all zip codes are not created equal, here's a map of zip code inequality. And economic growth and economic development and, and economic health also correlates highly with physical health. Here's, let me just break this out. If you look at this, if you look at this map, it says the darker the area toward the brown, that's distress. As you go toward the blue, that's the more prosperous. You know, I gave this talk somewhere, and a student was telling me, that's not brown. They say, well, Dr. Bullard, the best color you could probably see is salmon. <laughs> you know, the, the salmon color is the most distressed areas. And I had to correct him. I said, I have a PhD in sociology. Now, when I was a kid, we didn't have salmon in my Crayola box. <laughs> we had brown. I have, I have a PhD in sociology, not Crayola. So we can call it brown, or we can call it salmon. But you would rather not be in salmon, you'd rather be in blue. Where you live also affects how long you live. In this case, the lighter the area, the shorter your life expectancy. As you start getting toward the darker areas, Brown or the brown or the whatever, life expectancy. So if you look at that pattern, there's, there's a geographic bias in terms of, of what's going on in terms of how long people live. And there are reasons for that. And I'm going to just keep this mental map in your head. We're going to divide the country in a, in, into northeast, south, midwest, and west. And where am I? I'm in North Carolina, right, today. I'm sorry, Maryland. I was in North Carolina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I've been on the road, so please forgive me. <laughs> I came from Texas, and I'm in Mar where, where's Maryland. Let me see. 
Oh, it's the one that was a little wet. Yeah, there it is. Ready. Okay. Let's go. That's, that's where it does. I, now, I know there was something about North Carolina stuck in my head. The southern states, the northeastern states, the midwestern states, and the west. Uh, exploitation of land and exploitation of people. I wrote a book called Dumping and Dixie, and Dixie is the South. There's something about the South that's unique. And the South has a legacy that is unique, that is different from other parts of the country in that it had legalized slavery, had a history of Jim Crow segregation, resistance to civil rights. The South is the poorest region economically, and it's also environmentally the most degraded. The South modern civil rights movement was born in the South, and so was the environmental justice movement, born in, in uh, Warren County, North Carolina. Vulnerable places, vulnerable people. Here is the old South in terms of uh, 1860 map. Look at this map, and you will see that the red represent the old slave states of the Confederacy. If, you, if you, your mental map takes you back to the area that has the shortest life expectancy, you'll see that there is some relationship. This is 1860, and you're almost talking about 100 years later. It's that same footprint is there. If you look at the whole line, this, that red part, that, that's segregation by law. That's Jim Crow footprint that emerged out of 1860 slave map. This is the black population in 2010. The concentration of African Americans is in the southern, north, uh, south central, south, and going all the way across Texas. These are the, that's the geographic footprint of African Americans. Has not changed that much. Now, there are, there are uh, black people all over the country, even in places like Maine. <laughs> Three people. Uh, and, and Here's the, here's the Latino Hispanic population in terms of South Florida, uh, Texas South, and West. This is the black people of color population in terms of where, where people of color, African American, uh, Latinos, uh, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders. If you draw a line across half of the country, the bulk of people of color are concentrated in the bottom half of the, of the US. Which, did you, I'm sure you knew that. Oh, wrong way, sorry. Yeah, okay, now here's a map. Keep these mental maps in your mind. This is the poverty map. I'm giving you different belts, different corridors. This is the, this is the poverty map, and that dark blue represents uh, the poorest states in the country. And that bottom half is the poorest. The bottom half of the United States is the highest concentration where people of color are. Scorecard, this is a state health system's performance. The dark blue represents the bottom quartile, the worst state health departments or the, in terms of performance. Worst place to be a kid, this is any KC study, showing if you look at that dark, I mean that light yellow, look at the part they were in terms of children's, all, when you talk about children, all kinds of things that amenities and, and, and conditions and well-being, et cetera, that bottom part. This is a concentration of kids who um, are free lunch programs or lunch programs in terms of poor kids in school, high concentration. Like in, uh, in Texas, it's 60%. In Mississippi, it's 71. Seven out of 10 kids uh, are in some, are. This is the uninsured belt. High concentration of, of people who are uninsured that dark green. Keep these mental maps. I call this a stupid map. <laughs> the dark blue represents the states that said we're going to sue the federal government because we don't want Obamacare. We want to die. <laughs> it went all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. Look at the heavy concentration of those, of those southern states. Very poor, uh, bad health departments. High, uh, high um, well, they have a short life expectancy, et cetera. Oh, shoot, I'm keep going wrong. Unhealthiest states. Look at the 10 unhealthiest states. 10 out of 10 
Mississippi, Louisiana, fight over who's going to be on the bottom. Heart disease, look at this heavy red or brown. That's that belt where heart disease. Stroke belt, heavy purple. This is obesity, obesity belt. I won't call it fat belt, but obesity. Look at, look at <laughs> Mi Mississippi. Mississippi, almost 34% of, the, of, of households in Mississippi are obese. The skinniest state, Colorado. Red is, you know, the, 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 the most obese, the least obese, Colorado. Now, we have a, a theory about Colorado. Uh, only 19% is, is the skinniest. Mountain high, mountain high air, bean sprouts, tofu, marijuana. <laughs> This is congressional district where food, heart, food is a hardship. Food insecurity. Look at the high concentration of food insecurity in congressional district. Look at the salmon colored area, or pink. You start seeing these overlays. Here is no car and no supermarket. This is the food desert. How to get, look at the heavy concentration of brown. No car, no supermarket. So where do people shop? Where do they go? How do they get the food? How to make groceries. Here's a cancer belt, dark brown. Where you, <laughs> where you live? Oh, okay, I did that already. Okay, here's one. Here's power plant mortality. In terms of these dirty power plants, coal fired power plants, and you look at the concentration, and as you look at the, the concentration and the mortality, and you look at the health effect, I mean, this is not random. Look at, you can see the concentration. The politics of dirty power, 68% of African Americans uh, live within a 30 mile radius of a power plant. 56% of whites and 39% of Latinos. These power plants are not randomly distributed and people who live close by create big problems. Lots of people live near these big dirty power plants. As I said, it's not random. Here's refineries, oil refineries. There are 150 in the country. They're located in 32 states. They're not randomly located. But where they're located, the disproportionate share of people of color live um, near them. Half of the people that are at risk, are at increased risk from refinery pollution are people of color. Now, people of color are disproportionately located near and have overexposure in terms of the numbers. People of color only make up about 37, 38% of the population, but in this case, we're talking 52%. That's a better shot. So you see, I live in the Gulf Coast, and we got lots of refineries. We produce a lot of oil and gas, and, and in many cases, where these facilities are located, are dis are people, are, are, are people of color, they don't, in many cases, they don't work at these plants. They can walk to work, but many of them don't work at the plant. Fighting for clean air in the shadow of refineries. This is not trick photography. This is Houston. This is a school located across from a huge refinery. Kids play across the street from refinery. This is Houston, Texas. This, this is Louisiana. I took, this is Norco, Louisiana. I took this picture 30, no, 25 years ago. This is, a, a, this is a community. It's not there anymore. They, we fought and got them relocated. Community that was sandwiched between two refineries, two shell refineries, Norco. And there's a park that's located right across the street. This is Corpus Christi. This is Port Arthur, Texas. Public housing project was located. It's closed now with you know, Hilton Kelly and his group fought and got this uh, 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 public housing development closed and the families relocated. But it was located across the street from this huge refinery. This, this is Houston, Texas, again, along the ship channel. Um, this is Manchester community. Houses that are just right next to the refinery. Neighborhoods are killing. Even breathing is risky in some neighborhoods. University of uh, Minnesota researchers found that people of color breathe 38% more polluted air than whites. People of color are exposed to 46% more nitrogen oxide than whites. Breathing. Dirty air, you know, Harvard studies have shown that African Americans are nearly tw 
three times more likely to die from exposure to airborne pollutants than other Americans. You start looking at these studies coming from different places, they all point to a, you know, a single factor that poor people and people of color are at greatest risk and that because of where their neighborhoods are located, they have more exposure and potential exposure, not just to pollution, but also to explosions. And we're talking, in many cases, huge problems showing up when it comes to health outcomes, whether it's asthma, other respiratory illnesses, cancer, et cetera. Living with more pollution. Blacks are 79% more likely than whites to live where industrial pollution poses the greatest risk. This is true in 19 states for blacks, 12 states for Hispanics, seven states for Asians. Dumping on people, in 46 states, people of color live with more air pollution than whites. This is a, a recent EPA study. African Americans are exposed 1.5 times um, more to fi uh, fine particles than whites, and for Hispanics, 1.2 times. You start looking at these studies and you say, well, dog, what's going on? And some people want to make it a, a, a poverty thing. No, it's not a poverty thing. There's a study that was done by, uh, in 2008 by a professor at the University of Colorado found this unequal burden that even, even income, even being middle class does not insulate black people from this pollution disparities. African Americans who make fifty to $60,000 a year, relatively affluent folks, are more likely to live in neighborhoods that are more polluted than whites who make $10,000. You say, how can that be? Housing discrimination and residential segregation. Race trumps class when it comes to pollution and when it comes to housing. It's easy for a low-income white family to escape a polluted neighborhood than it is for a black middle class because of housing discrimination. Poisoning children. One third of US school children are at risk from having schools near these dangerous facilities that could pose explosions and accidents, et cetera. Here's a study that was recently done talking about while, while white children make up almost 52% of US public schools, only 28% attend high risk schools. Black students, on the other hand, make up 16% of total public school population, but 27% of schools that are at, at high risk. And that number is even higher. Latinos make up that number. OK, Latinos see that number jump from 34% while making up 24% of the population. So school children who are innocent, and you think you send your kids to school and they're safe, when you have all these facilities that are next door, uh, creates lots of problems when it comes to health. Here's a school in Houston that the, the name of the school is Cesar Chavez High School. Cesar Chavez High School. You know who goes there. Mostly Latino kids located across the way from a huge refinery. This photograph was taken. This is in Manchester neighborhood in Houston. This is, uh, photograph was taken by Juan Paras of Tejas, which is an environmental justice group in Houston. These are all the schools in Houston that's located near these hot spots. Over 100,000 kids go to school. Stu studies are now showing that having schools located so close to these dangerous polluting facilities is impacting, affecting uh, learning, GPA, uh, test scores, achievement. Studies done in California, Michigan, and El Paso showing the impact of having kids go and going to school next to these dangerous facilities and the levels of pollution and the emissions None of these facilities enhance the health of children. None of them. And so it's almost like saying we don't care. Asthma rates are, are rising, and asthma you know, has an environmental link. And children of color are disproportionately impacted by, by asthma. When we talk about another issue that's just growing across the country and across the globe, we talk about climate change. Climate change is more than greenhouse gases and parts per million. It's also about justice. So when we talk about all these vulnerabilities, those maps that I gave you, those are maps of vulnerability. It also means that the idea of geographic vulnerability also maps uh, closely with all those other vulnerabilities, lack of insurance, high poverty, you know, in terms of uh, uh, health conditions that are diminished, et cetera. And so we talk about vulnerable population, we talk about vulnerable regions and vulnerable places. The southern United States have experienced you know, dangerous storms and uh, climate-related uh, weather events at a ratio of 4 to 1. 
And so when we talk about the region, billion dollar weather events, this is 1980 to 2012. This is before um, Harvey. And if you look at the, the areas that's most vulnerable, the darker the area, the more the vulnerability. And you can see there's a, there's a vulnerability uh, footprint that from Texas all the way across to uh, Florida and going up that way. So the South has a lot of issues when it comes to trying to address climate change and climate vulnerability and economic vulnerability, et cetera. And if you start looking at the 90s, when you start looking at the darker the yellow of the app on the, on, the, on the right, and as you start looking in 2000 today, the vulnerability increases or the risk increases. The billion dollar disaster, uh, severe weather events is increasing. And so we talk about how we're gonna address it. So climate change will hit poor and people of color in the South hardest. This is a study that was in 2017 and it says, because the South is already poor, the poorest region, when you talk about you know, impacting economics, you're hitting the most, most vulnerable area. Uh, it says uh, uh, UC Berkeley, 2017 UC Berkeley study found that without effective climate action, the nation as a whole could see a 6% shaved off its GDP by the end of the century. You're losing 6% of the GDP nationally. But in terms of the South, you're talking a 20% drop. Now the South cannot, you saw those maps earlier, the South cannot afford to have a 20% drop in GDP. Poor people being poor. Marginalized people being further marginalized. And so extreme weather has already cost the U.S. $350 billion over the last decade. You see the severe weather events and climate, it's all over the country, but we're talking about certain people, certain places don't believe. And there are a lot of states of denial. I live in one. And so here's states that ha say they are climate skeptics or climate deniers, that red area and that shaved area. You can see there's a, there's a regional bias. who say, oh, there's no climate change. GDP, this is a percent of, of GDP spent on power. In other words, it costs more to uh, air conditioning house in the summer and heated in the winter. The, the, the red represents the highest cost of doing it. The poorest area got, whoop, let me see, back up. Okay, here's one, state renewable electricity standards. Green is good. It says state's renewable electricity standard. Green is good. Yellow is okay. White is bad. That's not racial. White is those areas. Uh, <laughs> They have not done anything. Look what the white is. We don't do any climate change. We're not going to do no rural energy. A disproportionate share of states that have not done a whole lot is in the South. Here's states of, status of climate adaptation plans. States that say, we're not going to do an adaptation plan, but the same areas that get hit the hardest have done the least. Protecting the most vulnerable in major disasters, the people most vulnerable before the storm, before storms, also the same people population, communities after. We saw that in Hurricane Katrina. We saw New Orleans get flooded. We saw the houses, rooftops, houses. We saw people washed away trying to escape. This is 2005. We saw people in, you know, convention center. We saw Superdome. Looked like people trying to escape war zone. Morial Convention Center. This is in Houston, 19, I mean, New Orleans, 19, uh, 2005. Harvey, 2017. Same pictures, looks like the same area. Floating down the rivers, houses gutted. George L. Brown Convention Center. It's a different convention center, but the same people, most vulnerable. And if you look at who's in the convention center, you look at the Houston Ship Channel, you look at the Petrochemical uh, uh, concentration, these are also concentrations where houses are. So if you talk about impact of pollution and impact of flooding, the people most impacted by disaster, whether it's natural or man-made, or whether it's pollution or it's flooding, these are the same people. We know what happens when we address air quality. We know what happens when we proactively go after tackling. 1996, when we had the Olympics, we couldn't drive our cars. We had to use MARTA. And the number of emergency rooms went down. Uh, it says by, decreased by uh, 40, almost 42%. The air quality went, uh, uh, was, was better because 
We couldn't drive our cars. We had to park and ride the public transit. When we clean up our cities, we extend life expectancy. And, and the cleaner the area, the more months you get. Uh, benefits of clean air, we know all kinds of benefits of clean air in terms of economics, in terms of policies that, that drive places where, where uh, people are moving to and, and people are saying, well, I want to move to that area because it has clean air. It has, it has lots of amenities. It has, walk, it has walkability. It has alternatives to driving. Those things, are, those things play out in terms of increasing the quality of life and the quality of health in a healthy community. Building Just and Sustainable Communities. This is a book, you know, uh, Julian Azerman, uh, uh we wrote after the World Summit on Sustainable Development that was in uh, Johannesburg, looking at sustainability and what it must have. It must address equity, social inequality, and resilience. Must deal with develop, equitable development, families below poverty, and widen health, income, and wealth gap. Addressing equity is a prerequisite to achieving, uh, to achieving resilient communities before and after disaster strike. If people talk about, well, let's, let's be, build a resilient community, it's almost assuming that you can just start with a clean slate and talk about resilience. You also have to deal with those residuals, those leftovers, that inequality that's baked into the system that says all communities are not at the same level when you talk about building or rebuilding. And I'm talking about Houston right now, post Harvey, that, that if we don't build equity into uh, the rebuilding process, we will build on inequity and money will follow money and money will follow power and communities that have always been left behind will get left behind again. So what we're saying is, is that we have to dismantle this dominant paradigm that created the inequality across the board. And the only way we can do that is making sure that we have a fair, open, transparent process and that equity lens or frame must be applied across the board. Otherwise, we're talking about uh, building something or rebuilding something that, that does not um, conform to what our ultimate goal is, is dismantling those structural uh, inequalities or those structural factors that create inequality. Thank you very much. Short answer is yes. Uh, what's driving a lot of the siting of, of the cell towers and other kinds of, of technology oftentimes is economics. Poor school districts oftentimes will say, they'll, they'll get um, a proposal to say, well, what, can we put a tower nearby or can we put it in the property or can we put it on this? And the economic, it's more of an economic driver uh, for uh, for resources, for funds. Uh, and without thinking of the potential for what it may have uh, in terms of uh, the children. And I see some school districts backing away, pushing off, but a lot of those uh, school districts, you know, five years ago, eight years ago, have already committed to having uh, those, those towers and those facilities on site. Um, economics is a powerful driver uh, when people say we, our school budgets are cut and, and we don't have any revenue uh, generators and, and our you know, families don't have a lot of money and you know, uh, we get our school systems uh, where we pay our school for our schools is, is uh, home, um, homeowners 
uh, through, through property taxes. I mean, that's a, that in itself is unequal and creates that inequality and drives that kind of, of push toward um, going to the, the poor districts or going to poor neighborhoods, et cetera. And many of these proposals would not even be, you know, thought to go to a very wealthy, rich area. So, the, so those, as researchers, we need to point, in schools of public health, we need to, you know, highlight the potential risks associated with that and, and make uh, testimony to some of our school board uh, meetings and, and at least give, the, give them uh, what some of the downsides are. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Trey Sherrod. I work with Anacostia Riverkeeper. Uh, we have a unique opportunity for everybody in the room right now. The toxic study of all eight and a half miles of the Tidal River is open for public comment for about a week and a half more. Is there any precedent or strategy you can suggest for getting risk assessments and remedial investigation reports to pay attention to past harm. They all act as if everybody who's going to be affected starts getting affected when they publish the final document, and that's just not the case, especially since the exposure is less going forward than it has been. Yeah, it's it's very difficult, uh, but not impossible to to uh, impact uh, policy analysis and research protocols and getting people. Uh, who are charged with uh, moving the paper and getting the studies done and getting analysis done, but you have to bring to the table uh, a diverse group of constituents and, and stakeholders and, and a very um, vocal community that, that's informed about what has happened in the past and going forward, you know, trying to not only just go forward but also Making sure that uh, resources get get uh, uh, directed to uh, corrective action, and a lot of times, uh, if that's not done, th there there are assumptions that uh, we don't have to look at past the past, and we can just act as if you know everything is is just looking looking ahead, and that's you know we, we have to involve different segments of the community and, and let folks know that, that the process is open, transparent, and that people are welcome into it, even though people who may not, quote, consider themselves environmentalists, but understand that if, if going forward that this project will, is a public project that, and that the use can be uh, widespread across and the benefits can, can, uh, can and should accrue to everybody. And, and so, and that's an, more like an educational framing kind of thing to get as many people involved and, and to own the process and hopefully influence it in a way that's equitable and fair and just and, and done in a way that, uh, that people can see that uh, it's important for them to take ownership. And it's not just, you know, Chesapeake Bay. It's, that's, I found that to be true in a lot of projects. And some people, uh, projects that, that are to be develop in neighborhoods or in air, ge uh, geographic areas, if people don't take ownership, they may see that's, oh, that's a project that they're placing over there. Uh, but, but monies are being used, uh, public dollars are being used, public-private dollars are used, uh, being put in this, that it should be for everybody. And, 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 th and it should be planned that way so that people can say, oh, that's our project. And if people take ownership, you, you'll find out it'll, it'll be a better project o overall. Uh, howdy, Dr. Bullard. My name is Patrick hey, uh, Patterson, uh, currently a transportation planner for the Montgomery County Planning Department and former planner for the Harris County Community Services Department. Okay. Um, with the tax day floods of 16 and uh, seeing how the multiple agencies that should have been more unified and how they would approach handling that. Um, and seeing how they did it. Um, do you foresee any type of improvement? We know that zoning is not going to happen, but we do know that there are plans, whether community or master, that could be implemented and have been implemented in the past. Do you see them gaining any teeth? Well, that's uh, getting teeth. Uh, after you are 100 and something years old, it's difficult. Uh, but I do think that Harvey 
has changed everything. And there are people who today uh, are talking about um, uh, changing uh, development regulations and patterns that probably three years ago were not even considering discussion. Um, and the, the fact that uh, we had uh, two floods uh, previous years back to back before Harvey, but Harvey was a wake, uh, wake up call. A uh, uh, couple of days ago, uh, the Harris County Commission, Commission uh, Commissioner's Court had a hearing on we're getting ready to have a bond election and $2.5 billion. And uh, there are a number of us that testified, part of a coalition for environment, equity, and resilience, SEER. And we had, you know, environmental groups, faith-based, environmental justice groups, um, uh, conservation groups that testify. And we came up with our plan is that if Harris County is going to pass this bond, then there has to be language in the bond that talks about equity, that, that speaks to the issue of projects. Instead of having, in the past, money follows money, money follows power, we're talking about making sure that, that, that there's built into this whole process uh, projects that are designed specifically and, and in terms of money following need. You know, if, if you draw uh, Houston in half, Harris County has a disproportionate share of, of the west side uh, is more affluent than the east side. Most of the east side of Houston is, is the industrial side and a disproportionate share of poor people uh, live in many of the neighborhoods and people of color. So, and these are the areas where a lot of the bayous flooded uh, and they flood consistently, but flood control dollars have not followed need. Um, and so we want to make sure that, that, that there is uh, a just recovery and equitable um, distribution of flood control dollars and other kinds of dollars. And it's not just flooding. The neighborhoods on the, on the west side, very affluent neighborhoods, huge, you know, big housing, et cetera. You probably saw it on television. The size of the roofs will give you the, the kinds of income we're talking about. Uh, they got hit hard with flood view and but on the, on the east side, also flooding and uh, pollution, you know, flooding in neighborhoods where there are lots of Superfund sites and all the industrial sites. And, and so it's not just flooding, it's also contamination. And, and so we're talking flooding plus. And so uh, we're dealing with housing. You know, when they talk about buyouts, um, right now, what if you buy a lot of people out in terms of east side, uh, where you have people who need housing and there's already a, a, a shortage of affordable housing, you have to build housing into this, uh, this bond to talk about affordable housing and, and other kinds of amenities to make those communities that have been historically uh, left out or invisible to make them whole. That's the only way we will talk about creating this just recovery. So uh, short answer is, is that there's a group, our, our, our uh, coalition, it's about uh, 25 organizations that have come together working on these issues. Very multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-sector, multi-issue working on these. This is the first time we've had that many groups come together. And it took a disaster to bring, bring us together, but we are together, we're working on this stuff, and now we're working on trying to come up with projects that, that come out of communities and bottom up. Hi, um, I'm Isabella. I'm a master's of environmental health student at George Washington University. Um, so I'm just wondering, what are what are your best suggestions for advocating for empowering um, and like building resiliency among um, communities who will disproportionately feel the effects of climate change? Well, I think it's very important that that uh, resources are placed in uh, community-based organizations and institutions and and those uh, infrastructures that, that people have trust and confidence and that those organizations are led by people who look like the community. And whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, churches, faith-based, or whether it's uh, children's organizations or whether it's part of other organizations. Um, for example, um, 
uh, we had a, a, a substantial grant from the um, W.K. Kellogg Foundation to, to, to uh, fund a consortium of historically black colleges and community-based organizations in the Gulf Coast where we have five states, you know, Florida, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. And our black colleges are working with community-based organizations in those five states on issues of health, uh, health equity, uh, children issues and families, uh, environment, and issues related to resilience. And so our schools have uh, uh, a lot of trust uh, built up over years in working with many of the communities that are frontline. These are the same communities we've been working with on environmental justice for decades. And so now with, you know, with, with resources being placed in our organizations to work on climate and issues of disaster and issues of resilience, I mean, it makes sense that, uh, that we basically try to build new leaders. And our, young, our students from these HBCUs and working in partnerships with the organizations, I think we are, it's a five-year grant, and, and uh, Dr. Wilson is one of our, you know, uh, experts and advisors, and, 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 and so, we, so we, we see that as one model in terms of a regional approach. Even though we know all five states are different, um, we have more in common as our Gulf Coast states, you know, uh, than, than we have. And we have all of our states are red states politically, and, they, and we have to m um, maneuver through that political uh, maze. Our states are, are, have, have, uh, are coastal, and our, most of our big cities are coastal cities. And so there are a lot of issues that we have to deal with, but we're working through it in a way using, you know, research, using policy, civic engagement, using education, using young people. I mean, it's, that I see as one start that we can assist. But resources, getting the resources in the hands of the communities uh, and, and trying to build up their, their infrastructure of their organizations is very important. So, take two, last two questions. So, make that quick quick so we have food that's upstairs. Oh, okay. So, so we got some, some moose bushes up there, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Bullard. Uh, Dan Smith, a uh, uh, longtime local resident here. And your um, story about students uh, doing the old fashioned sociological analysis just kind of had a light bulb go off. We have tremendous um, problems with development in this area. And one of the things that I see is the remnant forest areas that could be really vital to public health and environmental health are in disarray, they're a mess, they're overrun with invasives, people think they're unsafe. That is in the interest of the developers who then can easily wipe them out. Yeah. I mean, how about, you know, an old-fashioned sociological study, what is the quality of these remnant forests in the different neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then how could we build on that for equitable protection of those? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for the inspiration, yeah. and uh, maybe yeah. we could. That sounds like a great project. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great project. Yeah. Last question. Thank, uh, thank you again, Dr. Bullock, for your presentation uh, and your legacy and the work you've done. My name is Darius Stanton, and I serve as the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator at the Chuck E. Bay Program Office. Um, and the question I have is two questions, but they're interconnected. Uh, can you speak to the responsibility that? the state and federal environmental organizations and agencies have um, to increase their involvement in environmental justice. And then, um, without the help of the state and federal agencies, can you speak to how we can think through entrepreneurship and innovation to create jobs and create a pipeline and a stream to make this a fund or revenue generator for green jobs and remediation yeah. for these communities? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, uh, that's a very good question. That's a hard question, too. Um, I, I, think it's I think it's important to understand that um, the federal government and the state government have a responsibility to assist and support. And when the state and the feds are working together, it makes it easier at the local level to, to get things done in a creative and innovative uh, entrepreneurial way. When the state and the feds throw roadblocks in, in the path of, of local 
uh, organizations or regional organizations that are trying to do stuff, it makes it difficult. But we should not be discouraged by this bump in the road. And I hope you all know what I'm talking about. I won't call in the name, but the initials are EPA. Uh, this is a bump in the road that, that we will get over this. And I think that a lot of the work that's going on, the good stuff that's going on right now in terms of uh, innovative and creative uh, entrepreneurial is happening in local communities and in, pro and, and projects with uh, those states that have decided they're not going to wait for the federal government to somehow ride in and save them or for the government to co-sign. They're moving fast and furious. Even in some states where the feds are trying to push them back or, or somehow slow them down or, or, or dismantle those programs where they have decided uh, they want to have um, state programs that are more stringent than the feds or to be creative and innovative more so than the feds. And so I think, you know, I, I want to cheer on uh, local um, initiatives and state initiatives that, that, that are doing this. The state of North Carolina, for example, which is in the South, the birthplace of the environmental justice movement just uh, came up with this um, environmental justice, um, what is it? Board. board. Yeah, the, board. the board, statewide, to deal with some of the major environmental issues. This, that, and it came out of the state uh, uh, environmental justice, justice um, the state environmental protection, whatever the, uh, is it DEQ? DEQ? Yeah, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, or DEQ? So, so, I, so the idea of, of, of stopping uh, innovation and creativity, I think we should be speeding it up. And most of the climate work that's going on in the country is happening, happening within the states and within the cities. And so I, I think that should continue to drive it in our, in our, our large cities and our cities that, are, that have decided on their own that they want to they wanna have a more... Uh, climate friendly and climate resilient and, and uh, a city and a, and a region that, uh, that can address some of the, the major concerns. Uh, some, of them, some of the issues are with us right now and, and some of them are projected to even worsen in the future. So, so I, I say go for it. And if young people can get involved with any of the, the city governments or county governments that are developing climate action plans and sustainability plans and and dealing with uh, resilience and plants. I mean, I, I'd say, you know, and the School of Public Health and pl urban planning and sociology, it's, it's wide open. It's an interdisciplinary um, initiatives and, and journal journalists, you know, need to be, because they can write up communication folks, because they can frame the issues and communicate it out, the importance of so it across no matter what discipline. And that's what we need today. We need it badly, and uh, I see some of that happening you know, as I travel all across, you know, a lot of it is happening. It doesn't, you know, reach to the level of making headlines. And so, and in some cases, that's good because it's below the radar. Thank, Thank you very much.